At the ripe old age of 30, Hawaii born and raised Quinn Kelsey has grabbed the brass ring in the opera world, a major role at the New York Metropolitan Opera. A baritone, Quinn played Chouinard in the Met's production of perhaps the most beloved opera of all time, Puccini's La Boheme, which also reached a nationwide audience on PBS's Great Performances at the Met. It's just one of the highlights of a whirlwind career for the humble, soft-spoken native Hawaiian who attended Stevenson Middle School and the UH Lab School in Honolulu. We'll sit down and chat with Quinn Kelsey about his journey from Manoa to the Met next. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. This episode of Long Story Short features Quinn Kelsey, who is a rising star in the intensely competitive world of opera. Critics have described his voice as a beautiful instrument, notable for its flexibility and warmth, with a honeyed timbre and an ability to plumb expressive depths. Growing up in Honolulu, Quinn seemed destined to become an opera star. Both of his parents, Chris and Debbie Kelsey, are accomplished singers who performed in many Hawaii opera theater productions. For Quinn, an interest in music was a given, a natural part of childhood. My folks actually met singing a duet at the university. And I always love to say, you know, be able to brag and say, oh, you know, my, my, my folks met in music and, you know, I get, I get certain kinds of music from my father and certain kinds of music from my mother. How does it break down? Well, my mother studied piano and, and she was the one who listened to a lot of classical music and um, sang in church. And so I guess everything else I got from dad, um, folk and rock and I guess my general appreciation for music sort of smashed together with those two. What was what duet was your were your parents singing when you met? Oh shucks, was it Lea Loha Le Makamai? I think, yeah, one that they still do. So <laughs> there's a lot of history in that. So was the the music appreciation for you effortless, or did they have to kind of say, "Come on, let's let's do your music now"? No, no, it, it, it was very much effortless. Um, it, you know. We, we are very much the, the, the tight-knit family because, because of our music. My sister and I grew up and, and our parents together with music everywhere. My mother was a choir director. She still is a choir director at the laboratory school and she, she's also a choir director at a Baptist church in Manoa. So as, as soon as my sister and I could, could carry a tune, it was, oh, okay. Now, now come and join mom's choir, or go, you know, go and sing there. And my father sort of did that too. He he was a member of, of the adult choir at my mother's church, and um, you know, and then opera chorus came along, and my mother was the first one to go do it because she was the one who had the background, and and then she sort of dragged my father into it. And um, as soon as my sister and I were old enough, we joined the chorus as well. And music was just, it was. It was so common, common sense for us, you know, that we didn't think twice about it. Any particular kind of music you liked when you were younger? No, I, you know, I sort of pride myself when I, when I say that my, my, ta my tastes were pretty eclectic from, from a very young age. Uh, definitely lots of Hawaiian music growing up, you know. I mean, oh, the, I was talking to my father this morning about the old KCCN jingle, jingles, you know, with, with Auntie What's-Her-Name and, you know, chiming the every quarter hour or whatever it was. So it was just, there was just so much going on that, you know, we, we pretty much ran the gambit of all the different genres of music and, you know, I still enjoy them all. I like to say that music, ha music is sort of like a mood, you know, for me. That however I'm feeling at, a, at an opportune moment, parallels with some kind of music, you know, and so that's, that's when I'll, I'll listen to. Punk rock. Or something, you know, you know, working out, okay, punk rock and heavy metal, or, or relaxing, you know, soft jazz, or, or, you know, some kind of nice symphonic music. I mean, it, it all just kind of fits into a specific moment. There's no kind of music you just don't like, just hate to hear it? Um, <laughs> I, for whatever reason, I just haven't been able to, get my brain around country western. 
Really? Sorry to say that for people out there who, who really enjoy it. I, 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 I like a lot of different things, and I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just a specific kind. But well, it has a lot of themes, like opera. You know, just you know the the deep sadness of the human condition. You're right. You're right. You're Lots right. of emotion. Sure. So I don't know. Maybe maybe I need to give it another try. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit that I'm a neophyte when it comes to appreciating opera, and Quinn was very patient in explaining the rudiments of the art form to me. Things like a singer's range. Quinn is a baritone, so he's considered for certain roles, usually not the romantic leads, which are traditionally written for tenors. Range is not typically a choice one makes, it's something one discovers. And Quinn discovered he was a baritone at that awkward age known as adolescence. It's just that age where the voice kind of sounds funny. It's because, you know, puberty is taking over and the body's changing. But because I'd been singing at such a young age, the whole vocal mechanism, I guess, uh, began to mature or change earlier. So, funny story, there's a duet that my father and I sing at Christmas, and until my voice dropped, I sang at a range that was above his, and that's just what I knew. And somebody recorded it, and then, I think the following year, my voice dropped. And so we had to get a new arrangement of the music. And I began to get used to singing in the lower range. And then I saw the video, and I was going, that's just wrong. There's something wrong about that. I don't do that anymore. You know, that it didn't feel comfortable because, because my voice had, had made that huge transition. I dropped from a boy soprano all the way down to probably a bass or a bass baritone, which is pretty low. And I stayed there for a while. Um, until I started to begin actual formal training in, in uh, voice techniques and things. When did opera come into your consciousness? Mm, I guess, as I say, my father went, uh, went into opera chorus uh, after my mother. My mother dragged him into it. Um, and so that was about late 80s. So my sister and I were finishing, were at the end or finishing uh, elementary school. And they're just there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for us to get into opera. We, we would have expected to just follow mom and dad and go sing with them in the chorus, but we were way too young. Well, what did you think of it when you heard opera? I mean, for some people, it's, it's off-putting. It's hard to understand off the top. Well, we, we didn't understand everything about it, but, but we understood the music part of it, that, oh, this is just music. You know, it's just notes like everything else we do, you know. Um, you know, no, it's, it's, it's not in Hawaiian. No, it's not in English with, you know, with uh, singing a hymn or something. But, but it's still notes. It's still notes and it's still words. And we'll deal with the words later. But it's still music. And so... Did you get a sense it was telling a story or was that to come later? That's what it came later. It was just that it was music and it was, that's what we, that's what we knew how to do. And everything else just fell in. I mean, the appreciation for the actual art form came later. But right away, first of all, it was that mom and dad are doing, it, doing this, so we should do it too. By the time Quinn Kelsey was a teenager, he'd been exposed to all kinds of music. Before he became a voice major at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Quinn had no idea he was destined for a life in the opera until he experienced a taste of the big stage. One small realization was um, the first time I stepped on the stage at Blaisdell, you know, and before then, you know, the, um, the symphony had always had school programs where all the public schools and all the private schools come in, you know, for a day or two and, and you know, they'll play Star Wars and they'll play Indiana Jones and all that kind of stuff and you go, oh, wow, you know, I know that. And it, and it, was, it was so exciting because here's all this movie music, but it's, you can actually see them playing all the instruments. And that's all I'd never known of the Blaisdell was the stage and the way it looked from the house. And the, f the first day that, that we, were, um, we were at the Blaisdell after rehearsing at another hall to be able to walk out on the stage and take a look at all the scenery and everything and where we're supposed to be and, and just to have that perspective, looking out into the audience and remembering, well, you know, I used to sit up in the balcony over there and, and how different it was. 
and from then on I was hooked. Didn't get scared of all the people looking at you and what would happen if you made a mistake, nothing like that? There was a lot more of it definitely in the beginning, but uh, my sister and I had, had been had been in front of audience, my folks and I, and, you know, we'd all um, performed in front of people, so it wasn't that much of a of a problem. In fact, it was um, for a bunch of years from then on until probably up until about five years ago, it was easier to perform in front of thousands of people than it was to perform for a group of 20 or 25. Because you could see faces in the group of 20 or 25? Yeah, that was a lot of it. And, and you knew that there were a ton more people out in the blaze though, but that you were far enough away <laughs> that the open space was, you know, was enough, so. Well, when did opera become your number one dream? Probably in the middle of, of, of college. Um, that it was still, it was still sort of a, just a, a novel, a novelty kind of thing through the end of high school and in the beginning of college. And then probably about the middle of my undergrad, I, I, I realized I had to, I had to really decide, well, what am I going to do? Were you majoring in vocal performance at that time? I did. Um, I, I declared my major um, by the, the spring. It was either the spring of my first year or the fall of my second. Um, I actually tried, because, because music is just, you know, so me, so us, I, I, tried, I tried other things. I tried, um, I tried visual art, you know, I love, um, I did a bunch of that in high school. And I really liked it. I had really great teachers. I tried marine biology because, you know, I love looking at fish tanks all day long. I could, yeah, could do that forever. Um, you know, besides the fact that, oh my gosh, we live in the middle of, you know, the biggest ocean in the world. I tried Hawaiian studies. You know, I, I have a huge respect and love for, for my culture and everything that it's about. And, um, you know, just, just to see if there's anything else because there was a, there was a part of going into music that sort of felt like like I was shortchanging myself, that I was just kind of slacking because I knew I knew that I, I had such a hold on it already. So I, I tried I tried to just give other things a chance just to see if there's anything else that would that could be as strong as music. And there wasn't. And so that that's when I said, okay, you know, let's let's do this and met with, with my advisor, and that was sort of the beginning of the end, <laughs> per se. And when did the opera part of the vocal performance come along? It, it, came, it came pretty pretty much right away. I mean, there was, uh, there was a lot of classical music besides opera, but there's, you know, so many of the, of the faculty uh, at the music department at the university are professional musicians themselves, and so there's just no way to, to get away from it, you know. And um, until I'd come to university, I'd seen so many of them on stage or in the pit or backstage and, you know, was already familiar with so many of these folks. And it was just a matter of taking that next step and saying, okay, this is what I want to do. And, you know, finally being able to take advantage of those connections that I'd sort of made already growing up in uh, the opera chorus. <laughs> Isolated in the middle of the Pacific, Hawaii is not exactly the first place the world's leading opera companies would think to look for budding young talent. Fortunately for Quinn, Hawaii Opera Theater created an apprentice program that eventually led Quinn to a job with the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Well, the Hawaii Opera Theater started a program uh, about the same time that I declared my major at the university. It was a small studio. Um, I don't know how they were able to, to latch on to all the, all the list of, of professionals that they did, but they did. I went to the San Francisco program because I, I met them. I met, uh, I met Mark Morash and Rick Harrell. Rick Harrell was the director of, of the Marilla program in San Francisco at the time. So got to know them. Uh, they, they came out uh, two or three summers, got to know my eventual boss at the, the Chicago, the Lyric Opera Chicago Apprentice Program, Richard Perlman. Through here at the Hawaii Opera Theater? Through here at the Hawaii Opera Theater. Oh, <laughs> 
One thing led to another, and now Quinn finds himself near the top of the heap. When you hit the big time, were the were people skeptical about this Hawaiian guy? Of course. Who is he? You know, we've never heard of him before. You know, looking at my resume and oh, he studied in Hawaii. Ooh. <laughs> it was uh, it was scary. It was terribly nerve wracking. But it just put this impression on me that you know, well, this is what you're going to have to deal with. You know, this is this is the kind of pressure you're going to have to. The pressure to perform to a very high level or the, the, the perception that if you're from Hawaii, you, you might not really get this opera thing. Both, both. You know, that, that people will expect so much more, you know, because, you know, who is this kid thinking he's going to come in here and do that? And it wasn't always, it wasn't ever that bad, but that there was, you know, there was that sort of undercurrent. But, you know, my experience um, with a television station that presents opera performances is that opera buffs are very exacting and discriminating mm. and uh, they don't have a lot of patience with imperfection. I mean they they root for you but they want real high quality. Well they you know because not just anybody can do it you know and you want somebody in the parts singing the roles that you can count on you know because because it's not it's not like getting up in front of you know the Saturday night group at, at whatever little mom and pop bar or something to, for for open mic night you know this is serious music and if you do it right it's just this beautiful thing you know so i i understand that they just they get really picky because because they they do understand what the possibility is for the outcome <laughs> Quinn is an imposing figure on stage. One critic compared his physique to that of a professional linebacker. I assume the power of Quinn's voice might have something to do with his build, a big diaphragm controlling his lungs and breathing. A newcomer to opera, I wondered if a large frame is necessary to excel in this field. And are there any skinny opera singers? Of course. And Who are really and, good. And they, they look, why are you asking me this kind of question? Um, no, I, I know a handful of singers. I have a handful of colleagues who, who are just in really great shape. They've developed their technique, you know, utilizing their, you know, their own physique. And D does it seem it to works. you, though, that most are bigger? And well, I, like, why is that? In, in my own experience uh, with, with colleagues, with colleagues who are, who are, you know, bigger physically, um, because your body is tuned to, to being able to handle all the, to, you know, the bulk and the weight. And, um, you know, that, that you have a larger lung capacity, you know, that, uh, that your circulatory system has to be able to work to, you know, to provide, you know, all the extremities and things with blood. So it's used to, it's used to, your body is used to performing in, you know, at that physical level. And um, when you know that you can, ha that you have all this extra breath, you know, and it helps, it helps, um, it helps to know that, that, well, you can hold this line out a couple more seconds because this, this will sound really good or that you can give a line much more shape because you've got the extra air. Do you do anything to develop your lung capacity? Uh, it's, it's, it's all a part of training, you know, uh, certain kinds of warm ups, um, just ways of always making sure that you sing, sing things a certain way. And it's more so you, the kind of thing that you have to do that you can't you can't study. I mean, studying studying yes in terms of you know working on a piece and and always remem remembering to to prepare for that one phrase that needs the extra air. But that's that's about it. There's nothing that you can do outside of singing the actual music. But we have advantages like that that uh, that a more slimmer body style wouldn't. But I mean, you know, that's not to say that that the that the the slimmer person can't sing. Stop.
New York City seems to be the home of so many public venues that represent the pinnacle of different performing arts. For the musician, there's Carnegie Hall. For the stage actor, there is Broadway. For the opera singer, there is the Met. It was magic. It was magic. Uh, Can you see faces in the crowd? Some. Some if you, you know, if you get down close to the edge of the stage. Enough. Are you really looking though? No. But, uh, I mean, you know, that's, it's the one company that so many singers aspire, aspire to. And uh, I remember it wasn't the first day. It was the second day because at the end of the first day, uh, I went to get my, my little badge and it's got, you know, it's, it's got a little magnetic strip on it because you can actually swipe it. Um, one, door, uh, one door takes you to the corridor that takes you down to the, the dressing rooms, which is nuts in itself because you, you, walk through, you walk through the corridor to the dressing rooms and you're walking in the footsteps of Pavarotti and all these other huge Cheryl Milnes, you know, all these people who are just, you think of opera and, you know, you list these people and here you are walking in their footsteps. You know, and all the, the decor in the dressing rooms hasn't changed. It's all the same stuff, you know, it hasn't, I mean, they've kept it clean and they've maintained it, but you know, they haven't overhauled it all. So it's all the same chairs and pianos and bathrooms that, that all these big names use in it. And Presence of greatness. Oh kind my of gosh. And it was that second day when I, when, when I walked in and nobody gave me a second look because I just pulled out my badge and I went, Psh. And it was like they were saying, "You belong." Exactly. Ah, uh, you know the door. The door opened, so he must. He must belong here. And it was chicken skin. You know. And I did, mean. And did you feel I do belong here? I really I'm did. This good. Well, I I didn't go that far, and I'll I never will. But just just that just to know that you know you walked on a hallway, and people don't look at you if they don't recognize you. They just kind of look at you and, okay, well, the same way the security guard said, uh. You don't like the star treatment? Well, I love, don't get me wrong, I love the star treatment. You know, I, I love, I love the Mr. Kelsey this and the Mr. Kelsey that, and it's, it's you know, it tickles me to no end. But, um... I've always considered myself very easygoing, and so I, I just, I don't like to make a big deal about it. So I, I just, you know, I don't. It feels good to be able to, to know that my, um, my professional reputation is like this, and that I can, I can turn away, and I always sort of shrug it off when people say, oh, well, you know, you know, this and this and this and this. These reviews are so wonderful, and you know we 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 love listening to all this. You know, you know, we, did you hear what they said about you? And I always go, no, 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 that's not me. Oh yeah, it is. Well, then I just you know I, and I tell them I tell them I just I let you enjoy it, and you you say it all you want, and thank you very much. And it's just I just I don't ever want to be that person. You know, I don't want to be that person going well. Well, of course it yes. You know, where's where's my first class ticket? And you know, you must work with a lot of egos. Well, in, in the business, there can be a lot. Um, you know, I've, I've definitely seen a handful of them, you know, in the last, especially in the last uh, five years. So much has happened in these five years. I mean, it, my eyes have just been opened so much to working on these huge stages that I dreamed of getting to. But I mean, Chicago, the Metropolitan Opera, and San Francisco in one year, in one calendar year. You know, and I and I, I go I go home and I you know I, I talk to my folks on the phone and I and we giggle and laugh about it and you know they say, oh you know you know this was this was going to happen and I'm like well sure but it's happened in one year and and who's to say what 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 comes next? Sola. 
Quinn Kelsey lives in Chicago. He dearly misses Hawaii, but he doesn't mind Chicago's biting cold or the city's proximity to meaty opera roles. Here's wishing this rising young star from Manoa continuing success in the opera world. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Mahalo to Quinn Kelsey and to you for joining me for this long story short. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition. It's in Sony's DNA. Yeah.